views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Hi, welcome. This is Dr. John Martini. This is one of the most amazing and inspiring shows that you can listen into. If you want to be on the edge of your seats, if you want to open up your heart, if you want to expand your mind, and you want to meet incredible people, stay tuned because you're just about to experience a transformative radio show that will change your life. And you're listening to the Dr. Pat Show that's coming up right next. The following audio is via a Skype call. Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Talk radio to thrive by. Powerful, inspiring, and coming to you live, bringing you stories of people like you and me busting through and living life full out. Get ready to dare to wonder what your life would be like if you knew you could not fail. Hey, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's so great to have all of you tune us in and turn us on. Uh, let me just give a shout out to Mr. Benny. Hello, Mr. B. How you, Pat? How you be today? I'd be pretty good. Thank you for asking. We're going to talk about sports a little bit, a little bit maybe here right now. Maybe a little bit, maybe okay. I'm, I'm totally in. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. But I don't, I, I, I don't think I should mention that team, our team, that team. The one that seemed to kind of like you know, another team. close call and didn't pull out a win and missed three field goals and two interceptions. And should I go on that, from yesterday? That, that one. That, oh, I that, remember. That, 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 the 12th man. Yeah, it's okay. I think the 12th man showed up, but I think they needed the 12th woman, to be honest with you, yeah. uh, in the game. Um, but it was interesting in watching the game, Benny, and that's why today's show is so kind of cool. Okay. I'm watching, the, I'm watching the game for Shaz is joining us here today. But the most important thing is we're watching this show and I'm watching the officiation. And all of a sudden I turned to my friend and I said, this is a football game. And I says, that's, that's a woman, the referee. And my friend says, no, it is not. I says, I swear I, uh, I could, you know, and I got to tell you, Benny, it was the only time I saw her face was at one time. And I said, I know it was a woman and the people I was with were so darn sure it was not a woman officiating the football game. And I thought, and I got into a big discussion about this, knowing that I was going to be talking about the closer today. And we start, it was almost like we didn't get into like a fight, but we got into a conversation about, I was accused of wishful thinking as I always am, you know, to see a woman in that officiating role for the Seattle Seahawks game here in Seattle. And I swear I, I saw that. And everybody around me wanted to argue that, no, that wasn't the case. B, that would never happen. And finally, somebody said something like this. What a great way to start this show off, right? I, I don't know if Shaz is still with us or maybe like she hung up the phone by now. But um, but in the middle of this, you know, one of, one of the, the people turned around to me and said, you know, Pat, if there was going to be a woman officiating – a football game, it would be in Seattle. And then I thought, uh, I'm not going to say anymore. I am just going to wait for, um, I just got to wait for uh, Shaz Kong joining me here today. I just got to wait to talk with her about this because I didn't know this. And I ran into another sports situation playing in a table tennis tournament on, on Saturday myself. But here's what I want everybody to know. I love that we are speaking about things. I love that Chaz is speaking about things that we just don't want to talk about. You know, she has led teams in a few male-dominated industries. Yep, yep, she and I know what that looks like. Uh, and she is somebody that understands the working essence of what it looks like to be in an executive role in a research science facility, a global consulting firm, you know, the builder of an e-business, a brand strategist, and one of a handful of senior executives at Nike 
but why are we talking about this today? You know, what is it about someone like she, a graduate from Cornell, I almost went to Cornell, but I did it, and an MBA from the Wharton School of Business, you know, what is it about this conversation in her fabulous book, fabulous Ceiling Smashers, book number one, I can't wait for the rest, The Closer. What is it about this? And I'm looking at the book and I'm looking at the sneakers and I'm thinking to myself, wow, we have got a lot to learn, especially if you read this book. But today's conversation is for everybody out there. I'm going to tell you right now, phone lines are open. Um, Our instant messenger is open, 1-800-930-2819. Our IM is open at Transformation Talk Radio. And Dr. Pat, we're going to take your questions. Shaz, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Thanks so much, Dr. Pat. It's my, my honor to be here. Am I giving you your, am I pronouncing your name like with my New York accent? Even though I'm in Seattle, I have a little bit of that. I'm probably mispronouncing your name, but I do that really well, though. No, it's fine. It's fast. <laughs> and I'm, I'm a former New Yorker also. So. <laughs> <laughs> Look it. I had no idea that yesterday and Saturday would be the p- preview of what our conversation might be today. And I want to start, if you don't mind, I want to start with this big argument we had about whether or not I saw a a woman officiating a football game and how absolutely unheard of that was for the people in the room, both men and women. I think I thought we had come a little bit farther, but maybe I'm regressing. Can you help me out with this for a minute? You and know, congratulations I, on this book, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you know, it's interesting. I, I just had a discussion uh, just a couple of weeks ago with some female executives, and um, they were talking about, um, you know, women calling baseball games or officiating mm-hmm. football games. And the interesting thing was, even though, you know, the quality of the commentary was as high, if not higher, than the male, you know, male commentators, um, you know, the, what we found, or the uh, observation was that women in these roles were just getting hammered, you know, and people were saying, oh, you know, she doesn't know what she's talking about, or, First, you know, that was a bad comment, and uh, it's just interesting that in this day and age, you know, women who are in these types of roles aren't given more of a chance to succeed, and, and you know, we just, we just need to let them do their jobs, and I'm sure they're going to be better than some of the men. You know, I have to ask you this question. Are you ready for it? I've, I've been doing this 14 years. I'm not sure how much you actually know about, about me and about the show and about the network. But I actually am a female owner of a broadcast network. That by itself is a little bit weird right there. Mm-hmm. But, but here's what I want to ask you about. You know, you've written a fabulous book. It is really clear that you are... A, a voice, a powerful voice. But I'd love to know what challenges, what obstacles did you personally have to overcome to bring you to this very moment? Well, you know, I mean, being a female, especially a minority in mostly male dominated industries that I've worked in, I've had many challenges, you know, throughout my career. But, you know, I'll tell you one specific thing that was very early in my career that really set the tone for the rest of my uh, experience, really. I, mm-hmm. I was uh, working as a consultant, and I was working with a senior partner on a project, and we had to um, present our recommendations to our client. Um, it was at a uh, private country club in rural Pennsylvania. So we had a two-day meeting, and it was like their board of directors and their executive team. So the first day of the meetings went well. And I was downstairs, you know, kind of preparing for the next day. And then every, all the guys went upstairs. And then I went up to the bar. And this was in the 90s. I went upstairs to the bar and, you know, walked in, ordered a drink. And then the bartender looked at me and he was he looked really startled. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, miss, you can't be in here. And I said, no, no, it's okay. I'm legal drinking age. You know, I can I can order a drink. And uh, he said, no, no. He said, did you, you, did you see the sign? And I said, what sign? And he pointed up and above the door there was a sign that said gentlemen only. Yeah. And I said, you're kidding, that's not an antique? He said, no, that's the rule of the club. And so um, he's like, mm. you're going to have to leave. And I was like, I cannot believe it's, you know, the 90s. I'm getting kicked out because I'm a woman. And 
I just was shocked. But I said, okay, well, here's what we're going to do. Uh, can you make me my drink, please? And I will take it outside. And then by then, everybody in the room was staring at me. I was the only woman in the entire meeting. I turned around and I said, you know, we've been cooped up all day. So I'm going to go outside on the terrace and enjoy the sunset. So um, you're welcome to join me. And, you know, I walked out. And I was out on the terrace by myself for a while, and I thought, wow, nobody is coming out. And even the partner that I was working with did not come out. So, and I just was, you know, upset about the whole thing. But then I just thought, you know what, you have a moment of peace. So just, you know, relax, just get over it, you know, just try to bounce back. And then after a while, I heard this voice behind me, and, and uh, he said, is this a private sunset, or may I join you? And I turned around. And it was the CEO of the client. And I said, this is an equal opportunity sunset. Pull up a chair. And, then, <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> and I realized something, you know, so critical was that I, I was like, I have an opportunity to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the CEO. I mean, this is fantastic. The whole project, I never had a chance to talk to him. So I asked him all these questions I had. And um, then the next day in the meeting, he stopped the meeting in the middle of the meeting, and he said, oh, wait, I, need, I want to confer with my consultant. So the partner I was working with ran over there, and then the CEO said, no, no, I want to talk to Shaz. And so he you know, motioned me over, and he said, you know, based on our discussion about my leadership style and vision for the firm, you know, do these recommendations still work, or do we need to change things? And I said, oh, actually, you know, these are the things that we would need to change. So the really important lesson for me was really just about resilience. And mm -hmm. um, I know a lot of your you know, focus and philosophy is on, you know, transformation and, and mm -hmm. you know, how to make things better. And I think for me, you know, that moment taught me that if I wasn't resilient, if I didn't bounce back, then I wouldn't have had that great conversation with the CEO and then I wouldn't have been able to add value to his business the next day. So I think throughout my career, whenever I had challenges or setbacks, I always just focused on being resilient. And I think that's what the book is about. I mean, resilience is something that I think those of us that worked in the corporate world, I mean, I I worked in an environment for over 20, what, about 25 years. And I worked for an organization that was primarily male, and I worked for a primarily uh, male department in the organization. And, you know, one of the things I think we learn is – my mom used to say, honey, if it don't kill you, it'll make you stronger. And that <laughs> is the essence of resilience, though, isn't it? I, it is. It is. It is. Yeah. And I it think, is. you know, you've got to just like, you've got to either take a lesson or turn things around or just find some humor in the situation. And uh, yeah, I think all of those aspects are, are part of being resilient. What I found interesting in, in the book is, um, so here, this is another question, and we'll go to break, and you can think about it. Um, here we have this, you know, Vivian Lee, love that name, of course. Uh, I mean, clearly, there's, I know that there is a relationship to that, which we can explore. But here, here consultant, career, you know, there we go, right? And, and you, you know, introduced as the first female president, right? But we're talking about Portland. And I was surprised at the city that, you know, I mean, we could have picked a different city, but there was a comment made to me about this female officiator, this woman, and the comment was, if there is ever going to be one, it's going to be in Seattle, and Portland fits in that category. When we come back, I want to talk a bit with you about some of the myths, some of the, let's just say, misunderstandings is a nicer way to say that we have about what it takes for a woman to succeed regardless of cities. Stay tuned, everyone. And we got a copy of this book to give away. I hope we have a couple because it's fabulous. You know, there are some things that Chaz talks about in this book that, oh my gosh, I wish she does an audio tape. We'll be right back. Warmer, 
Tune in to Lucid Planet Radio with Dr. Kelly Neff. This hit show will illuminate your senses and empower you beyond your daily stressors and hardships. Renowned psychologist and author Dr. Kelly will captivate you with far-reaching topics and amazing guests as you wake to the greatest version of yourself. Learn to tap into your intuitions, think critically about our world, heal emotional and psychological wounds, and follow your passions to live your dreams. The Lucid Planet. Welcome home. Visit lucidplanetradio.com for more information. What is a brilliant culture, and how do we create them? Why are they important? Claudette Rowley has created a breakthrough five-step process to help you align your culture with your business strategy for exceptional results. Looking for a culture that drives organizational excellence? Listen to Cultural Brilliance Radio, the second and fourth Friday of each month at 10 a.m. Pacific and 1 p.m. Eastern on Transformation Talk Radio. To learn more or work with Claudette, visit culturalbrilliance.com. Are you looking for the perfect setting for your next workshop or retreat? At Spirit Fire Meditative Retreat Center, cultivating consciousness is what we do best. Our guests count on us to create an atmosphere that supports serenity and well-being. We lead from the heart and create space for the mind. Freshly prepared meals designed with local and organic ingredients, 95 acres of beautiful woods and pastures, and a facility built with green in mind. This is what you'll find at Spirit Fire. For more information, visit spiritfireretreatcenter.com. Do you ever feel as if you're working twice as hard but only getting half as far? Are you trying to connect with your path in life and finding it elusive? Mainstream Metaphysics Radio is a weekly call-in show where we harness our connection with the universe and use what is in our power to affect change for optimal success and happiness. This hit show bridges the divide between what is and what we do not know. Eve, named one of the country's top psychics, also known as the MBA Psychic, invites you on this journey for this live call-in show with readings, featured guests, leaders, and visionaries in both business and spiritual callings. So join Eve Thursdays at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com as she takes metaphysics mainstream. For more information about Eve, visit EliteTarot.com. That's EliteTarot.com. Best-selling author, spiritual life, and business coach Joe Nunziata brings his higher energy and no-nonsense style to people who are ready to make powerful changes now. Wake up, step up, power up with a shot of Joe. Join Joe the second and fourth Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern for 30 minutes of high energy, no-nonsense, and powerful tools to make powerful changes. Visit JoeNuns.com. That's J-O-E-N-U-N-Z.com. Doesn't kill you, makes you stronger. Stand a little taller. Doesn't mean I'm lonely when I'm alone. What doesn't kill you makes the fire burn brighter. Stand a little taller. Doesn't mean I'm lonely when I'm alone. What doesn't kill you makes the fire burn brighter. Stand a little taller. Doesn't mean I'm lonely when I'm alone. What doesn't kill you makes the fire burn brighter. Oh boy, I am so happy. I am so happy about this interview. I'm so happy about this conversation. Um, so here, chew on this for a bit. Sometimes the best man for the job is a strong woman. Yeah, that you're going to be able to see. Shaz, uh, what I want to do before we uh, start chatting again is, number one, first of all, thank you for giving us a copy of the book to give away. Um, Also, how can people find out more about you? How can they get a copy of the book? Let's give folks some information. Sure. Uh, Well, The Closer is available on Amazon. It's available on barnesandnoble.com and also greenapplebooks.com. Dot com, um, and it's also available in the Green Apple Bookstore. Uh, but uh, I also have a website called uh, SealingSmashers.com, and that um, gives a little bit of background on me and about the book and also uh, about um, interviews that I've done, things like that. Okay, so let's talk about, you know, each of us gets to show up in life and do stuff, right? So here I am, I, you know, I've got this radio show. I, I started Transformation Radio.fm network with 10 channels, all positive talk, you know, there is a purpose behind why I did that. You know, I've shared it, you know, from time to time with the listeners. So I always think there's something behind a mega effort. And what you've done is a mega effort. There's always something behind it. What was it pulling you forward? What was it pulling you forward to really take this conversation to the world? 
Well, the thing is, I was reading a lot of fiction where if there was a strong, smart female leader in the book, then she was either evil or diabolical, or she was trying to crush the careers of other women, or she was allowed to be uh, competent, but in her personal life, she was completely neurotic. And I think, you know, like you, I wanted to write about positive female leaders. And I know so many, you know, great, smart female leaders who are helping other women. And I thought there's no book about them or for them. And it was interesting because I, as I went through the publishing process and spoke with, you know, different agents, a lot of, well, actually one, one male agent said, oh, this is, you know, a great concept. Can you change the, the main character to a guy? And I was like, <laughs> uh, I, that's like, you know, I, I, just was, I didn't even know how to respond to him. I was like, that kind of defeats the whole purpose. And, you know, other people say, can you make her crazy about shoes? Can you make her desperate to get married? And I thought, you know, these things have been done. I want to write something fresh. And um, I really wanted to write something that was positive and hopeful, you know, just like your, you know, series of radio shows. You know, want mm-hmm. you want to take something and and you know bring a fresh idea to the space. And that was really what my uh, my goal was. And it was just also frustrating to not read about you know great female characters when I know they exist in real life. Yes, they do exist in real life. And, you know, we hear about them from time to time, right? I mean, mm-hmm. we really do. We we look around us sometimes in some days and we look at, okay, who's showing up? I know for me, um, I, I'm a bit older than you are. And so my history of looking at the women that have influenced me along the way. And then once I started the radio show, I got to interview them. I mean, it was like, okay, what, who's one of the first people I want to interview? Okay, uh, yeah, Gloria Steinem. Who's next? Shirley MacLaine. So, you know, in my brain, nobody told me, wait a minute, you're like this independent radio person. You can't talk to these people. <laughs> See, nobody told me that. So I just asked them. Um mm-hmm. Good and, for you. You just went out and did it. That's great. I did. And isn't this really what's being called forth now, too? I mean, isn't this really kind of, you know, in the book, my sense is that sometimes it's better not to ask permission. Is that a little mavericky, though? I, no, I totally agree. I mean, I think, you know, it's something that I don't see women doing enough of. Mm -hmm. But uh, just going out there and taking a risk or trying something, and and because I think a lot of times I see, you know, women feeling like they need to get permission to do something or, you know, they need people to um, all agree that this is, you know, something that everyone will support. And I think sometimes, you know, you know in your gut what's the right thing to do or, you know, you know that this idea is going to be something really great, then, you know, you just need to go out and get it done. And I've been in many cases where people told me something couldn't be done and, you know, ended up doing it anyway, and it turned out to be a success. So I think, you know, as a female leader, you just can't listen to naysayers. You've got got to listen to your gut. There's one story in the book with Vivian, and I wonder if we can talk. I I hope I don't give away too much of the book, but I'm excited to to, to just share a little bit. There's there's one story uh, in the book with Vivian, and I am so reminded of this in my own corporate journey. Um, It's the story where... You know, she she's got these clothes. They're 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 uh, you know she hung the clothes from like uh, the third box on the grid wall. I think is an explanation. And then all of a sudden, right? You know, the nine direct reports are coming in the room. They're walking in the room, and she's got these shorts, like shorts, real sh- you know, like you mm-hmm. wear them. And and she gets them engaged and she asks them a question, which most women wouldn't, I hate to say this, but doing something like this, where you're doing something a little bit out of the box, you're getting people engaged in making decisions. You know, this is about identify the pair of shorts that you think fits you. I mean, this is, I'm giving people a little bit of it. But in the end, there was something so positive about that. You know, there was something that she had to get done and got it done in perhaps a little bit of what would be considered an unconventional way. What do you yeah, think? That's actually inspired by my own experience, because when I uh, was at Nike, one of the things that I had um, kind of negotiated when I came on board was that I wanted to run a business. So I, I had a chance to run the global cycling business. I was the first woman ever to take that role. And the guy who ran the business before me was a former Olympic track cyclist. 
so, and my team, you know, was mostly men, very avid cyclists. And when I went around individually to meet each person, they, every single person asked me the same two questions. The one was, you know, uh, what do you know about the sport of cycling? And the second was, what do you know about the business of cycling? And, you know, I, I was honest. I said, not much. But I do know how to ride a bicycle, <laughs> and uh, they didn't actually find that funny. But um, <laughs> but you know then uh, you know but I you know everybody was asking me, and I thought, wow, these guys are really skeptical about whether or not I can do this job, and they don't even know me. I mean, they don't even know my skills or anything. So I I kind of took a little hit to my confidence for a moment. But then I, yeah. I took a step back and I said, wait a minute, this business has been tanking for seven six or seven years. It's never made a profit. It has so many issues. And actually the the CEO just said, Chaz, just fix it. You know, do whatever you have to do, just fix it. And I was like, great. So I, you know, said to, I got everybody together. I said, look, I don't know that much about the sport of cycling or the business of cycling, but I'm a a fast study and I'm, I'm, I'm expecting to learn it from you. But I do know how to turn around a business and I know how to turn around a brand. So hopefully you'll learn something from me. But in the first meeting, I knew I need to get these guys back on their heels a little and have them think about business in ways that they haven't thought about it before and, and help them understand why it's doing so poorly. So, uh, and, and I thought, if I just stand up there and say, here's what our new strategy is, you know, they're not going to listen to me because they don't already, you know, think I don't have credibility about, you know, the business or the sport. So that's why I kind of took a creative approach. And, you know, we had a, a huge conference table and I laid out like 30 pairs <laughs> of cycling shorts and some were huge, some were tiny. And I held up an iPod shuffle, and I said, whoever can correctly guess the sizes of all these shorts wins this, this iPod. So they got really excited, and they started calling out, you know, extra large, extra small down the line. And I said, guess what, guys? These are all medium size. So, you know, that's why our apparel returns are so high, because we don't, we're not using standardized sizing specifications or <laughs> fit blocks. And they were like, what? You know, I mean, it was interesting because I thought these people have been working on the business for a long time and, you know, they haven't been able to figure out why these problems keep, you know, persisting. So we did a lot of, you know, just really creative things and we changed um, the strategy. We um, broke records at Nike and we ended up growing the revenues 300 percent and making it profitable for the first time. You know, I I love talking with you about this. And one of the things uh, that... um, um, I want to talk about, and as a matter of fact, Benny, I think we should, should skip the break because I want to make sure we get some of these these questions in that are coming in from people. Um, uh, so here's one of the questions. Um, this comes in. I'm just going to read it to you if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, questions coming in from um, Mary J. Mary J. Is that Mary J. Blige? No. Could be. <laughs> coming in from Mary J. Mary J. in L.A. Okay. There we go. Um, some industries are more male-dominated than others. Some industries pretend to be – some industries pretend to be more fair than others. My experience is we're kind of all in the same playing field. The only difference is you can read the writing on the wall sooner. Has it changed for us in the world we live in today to continue to keep a powerful voice? Or is fear blocking most women today? Wow. 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 That is a, that is a loaded question. Wow. <laughs> Good if you Very if you good. type in your information, I'll send you a copy of the book. But I love the question. You know, yeah, it's a yeah. it's a two parter though. It's like okay, there are organizations that people look at and say, yeah, 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 male dominated. Then there are ones you look at and say, no, not male dominated. And what I think the question is, they all seem to be the same. But in any event, are women afraid to speak out today? More so. You know, this is an interesting question for me as well. What's your experience of it? Well, I think um, regardless of whether a, an industry or a company is male-dominated, I mean, I actually I have worked with some amazing men and me you know, too. many, many amazing men. So, and you know, yep. some of the men were uh, critical to helping me succeed. So, I, yep. I'm very grateful to them. Me too. Uh, but you know, I've had a great experience with men. You know, the, for the most part, some you know some bad apples here and there. But uh, I think the most important thing is not uh, the balance of the genders; it's really what the values are of the organization. And uh, there's a great book called True North by Bill George, and it, it mm. actually I think you'd find it really interesting too, Dr. Pat, because it yeah. basically goes through some very successful business people. 
but then it shows them in prior jobs where they were in a company where the values weren't aligned with their own values, and, and they were really, you know, just really failures in those companies. <laughs> so they didn't succeed until they found the organization that had the right alignment of values. So I think, you know, that's more important than, you know, the whether something's male-dominated or not, or not. But I do think also there are a lot of tricks to um, how to work in a male-dominated industry more successfully. Um, so I can talk about those a little, little bit later, but I also wanted to address the second part of her question, yeah. which is, you know, are women yep. afraid? And I think, you know, women, I, I think, need to just support other women. And I think, like, the whole thing with the Me Too campaign, I was very, you know, impressed that Ashley Judd, you know, just spoke out and, and let her um, story be told because that inspired other women. And I think before she did that, people just thought, okay, maybe this is only happening to me, you know, this whole kind of sexual harassment thing. And um, and they felt powerless. But now I think because more women are speaking out in more industries, um, I, I don't think the behavior will be tolerated as much. So I think that's a good thing. And I think that's uh, reducing the level of fear that women have. But, I, you know, there's always a concern, okay, if I speak out, is this going to hurt my career? So I think, you know, you can't speak about speak out about everything, but I think if there's something that you just feel is intolerable, then, you know, you have to, you have to stand up for yourself. I think that's what we're discovering. I mean, you know, I, I was uh, talking with someone about spiritual initiation in the last show and how sometimes things might happen to us. You know, uh, honestly, I've been fired from every job I've ever had. <laughs> and you, and I, and there are reasons why. And, you know, I, I worked with a coach once and the coach wanted me to look at, you know, what are the reasons you got fired? What do you need to change about yourself? Right. That was an interesting exercise. Mm -hmm. And when I stopped to look, there was a common thread across the board. Oh, what was and it? it in, in, and I went on to study it for eight years and research oh. it and write and write research about it. There are things we do in life that have to hold a level of integrity for me. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm selling hot dogs from a hot dog cart, cart in New York, right? And I refuse to give people the hot dogs that have been sitting in there for like two hours that look gray. Mm -hmm. So I got fired from that job because the, the boss guy uh, caught me giving them to a dog. And, and then my last job was because I refused to, imp I'm the head of HR now, right? I worked my way from the mailroom to be the head of HR. Here I am, the head of HR in the phone company. I, I actually was one of seven people to do the divestiture, but I'm in here and I'm the head of HR. I'm supposed to implement the first downsizing program, right? Mm -hmm. And it was going to be really good. It was going to be let people go, give them a lot of money, give them benefits, give them early retirement, do that. And I saw a report that pointed to the fact that that's not what they were doing. And my boss said, you have to fire Janine. Janine had 29 years, 11 months of service. That's one month from a full pension. Oh, so they, they wanted to get rid of her before, so they didn't have to pay To get rid of them all. And oh. I just I just walked up to my boss, and I walked up to the, the president, the vice, I walked in the boardroom, and I said, I'm not doing this. This is ridiculous. This is not Good what the company you. stood for. And I said to my boss, you can take my head count. And she did. Six mm. months before I was to get my own pension. I wouldn't trade that for anything in the world, though, Shaz, because I went on. I went back to school. You know, my life went in another direction. Mm -hmm, and I mm -hmm. did study the consequences of broken promises for eight years. Wow. But in the end... It's resilience. And I would love to hear from you about what constitutes the making of a strong woman such as yourself. What does well, it take? I think uh, you have to have I, I, a, a few things. I think, you know, one is resourcefulness. So when you're faced with a problem, I call it kind of the three R's. So the first R is resourcefulness. So resourcefulness is, you know, if you're confronted with a problem or a new challenge, Really, you know, trying to corral ideas from new places, trying to, you know, um, engage the talent that you have on the team, just really figuring out how to utilize all of the, you know, elements that are around you to help solve the problem. Um, so the second R, you know, we already talked about is resilience, and then, the, which is, you know, just being able to bounce back quickly. And the third R is really being relentless, and that is, mm. you know, just not giving up 
being persistent. And if you believe in something, then, you know, just working on it until you, uh, until you succeed. And a big part of, you know, the whole story for The Closer was that, um, you know, like you, I mean, the character is somebody who has um, a level of integrity that is not compromised throughout the story. And, you know, I think there's a lot of books where, you, you know, a lot of people were saying, oh, women like to read about, you know, damaged women. And I was like, I don't <laughs> think so. I think women no. like to read about strong women, and there aren't many strong women in, in <laughs> literature, you know, but... Uh, I was like, I would like to have a character who goes through a journey that is extremely tough, but, you know, she maintains her integrity throughout the book. And um, that was something that was really important to me. And it sounds like, you know, something that was very important to your career and your ultimate success as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's still important. And what I love about this book is that I found myself um, hanging on every word. Um, I want to do one thing real quick. Um, Let's give a copy of the book away. Uh, one eight hundred nine three zero two eight one nine. Love to give a copy of the book away. Um, Shaz, again, can we take a moment and let folks know how to find out more about you and about the work that you're doing in the world right now? Sure, I have a website called uh, SeilingSmashers dot com. I also have a page on Facebook, which is uh, Ceiling Smashers as well. And there's a lot of information there. And then uh, the book, The Closer, is available on Amazon, on barnesandnoble.com, and greenapplebooks.com. Okay. Here's the question I, I, I've been wanting to ask you. Um, as a woman, successful woman, there are, there are two parts to this. There's the old, you know what, you people, you can't have it all. You can't have the family. You can't have the success. You can't make the money. You can't take care. You can't do this. You can't have it all. So why don't you just give up? What do we now know about that you can't have it all thing? I I don't think it's true. I mean, I am, you know, I've been working my, you know, pretty much my whole life. And uh, (laughs) I I have twin uh, six and a half year old girls and I'm married to a husband who's CEO of a software company. So we've got a busy life, but I think, you know, there's a fallacy out there that I, I even hear younger women talking about it today, which is, you know, this whole work-life balance. And mm-hmm. and I, I hate that term really because oh, I, hate I it. don't, I, I hate mean, it. There, there's nothing oh. that, that doesn't exist. And, and no. it implies that everything is in equilibrium at all times. And that just doesn't happen. And I prefer to think of it as like, you know, work-life juggling, you know, in, in, at a certain point, you know, the work part is that ball is higher in the air. And a certain, another point, you know, the family ball is higher in the air. You've got to pay more attention to that. So, you know, your priorities are, are just kind of constantly shifting, but it's, you know, it's just kind of an ongoing, um, you know, kind of juggling process and, yeah. and you can do it, but you know, you just have to, you have to just be, I think, really, you know, focused and, in, in cases when you have family, you know, you just have to like plan ahead and be organized. <laughs> I am so glad to hear you say this because I remember being in, in a research program and I said, I'm not going to write about work. I'm not going to write about that. I'm not going to write about balance. I don't believe in it. And my chairperson who became my friend and we published papers together, she says, but you have to write about it. I said, no, here's what I believe in. I believe in harmony. I said, if you, if you replace the word balance with harmony and we can focus on how to create create this harmonious existence in our lives, which means some days we're spending more time on this, other days over here. But it's in, it's almost as if you're hearing a symphony in tune. And mm-hmm. we're the only people that can create that kind of music. We can't read a book about it. Nobody can tell you how to manage your day, right? Right, and right. I, I so, I'm so glad you said that about balance because I think it was the one single most thing that literally pushed women over the edge in the 80s. I agree. I mean, I love that term you just used, the work-life harmony. harmony, Because, yeah, Yeah. I mean, that is ultimately what you're striving for. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a fallacy. And then people think, oh, okay, well, if I want to have kids, then I I have to give up my career at this point. And uh, that's that's just not the case. I mean, actually, also, when I, when I, um, my daughters were nine months old, I started to write this book. And um, I wrote a chapter a week, and I got the book done in 10 months, which I'm told is pretty quick. And then, you know, the editing process, of course, took, you know, <laughs> several years, but uh, it was a lot more painful. But, um, you know, I mean, I was still working, and I had, you know, you know infants, and, and, you know, you just 
you just figure it out. You just make time. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you this question before we run out of time. What have you discovered? And I know there are so many in the book, though. This is a brilliant book, by the way. I love this book. Thank you. What are some of the potholes? I think you call them pitfalls. I like to think about potholes because I'm like from New York, right? Because potholes. Mm -hmm. What are some of the potholes that women step into that perhaps men don't? Well, I think um, as a woman leader, um, people don't expect a woman to be as decisive as some strong Mm -hmm. leaders are. And I think, you know, if you want to be successful, maybe I'll kind of flip it and say, in order to be a really successful female leader, you've got to be, first of all, focused on what needs to get done and have a really clear vision that you communicate extremely well. You've got to be decisive. You've got to be accountable and hold people accountable. And I think you need to model the behaviors that you want to see in others. But uh, I've been really um, surprised because it, when I've taken roles, I was um, the chief executive at, at Lucy Activewear, and that was a business that had never been profitable, and we got it profitable um, for the first time in history. Um, and my team and I, you know, it was a pretty lean team that we were working with, but, um, but I think, you know, I moved really quickly. And actually, my boss was saying, oh, well, you don't have to create the future vision, just, you know, stop the bleeding and try to figure out how to, you know, manage the business that you have. And I was like, if we don't have a vision of where we're going, then how do I get people excited about, you know, making these changes, which are going to be difficult. So um, we, and they actually, the corporation asked me to get the business profitable profitable in three years. And my Mm -hmm. team and I got it profitable by month 13. So, you know, we did move really fast, (laughs) maybe a little too fast, but, but in the end, you know, we got the results that we really wanted. Well, I think you and I really share that. I mean, I was given a a line job in order to be promoted to director. I was given a line job in graphics. You know, graphics was this internal service provider for the executives. And I was given a, and and basically I was given a line job. I was told that my job was to shut the whole operation down. And so I couldn't do it. I mean, I couldn't do it. So Mm -hmm. I took another route. I didn't tell anybody I was spending bun- budget money to automate graphics. I isolated the non-performers and put them in a, a, a row, an office suite next to me. I worked the graveyard shift to see that, you know, people on the graveyard sh- shift, you know, to stop drinking on the job. I mean, but we, uh-huh. we do some things like that, right? I yeah, don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean, exactly. You're so right. I mean, then the thing is also with um, – You know, even at Nike, you know, we were having trouble with our retail. And so, you know, people were like, oh, how do we fix it? And I said, well, (laughs) let's take the executives and we'll work on the retail sales for two days a, Mm. a, you know, a month or, you know, a few months or whatever, two days a week. So we did that. And they were like, you know, executives have never worked on the retail floor. And I was like, well, Uh. that's probably why they don't, you know, understand retail. So, you know, (laughs) so we did that and we were able to turn it around. And and I'm not opposed to, you know, getting in there, rolling up my sleeves. and, And, you know, that's how you learn. And, um. And I think women, I find women are more uh, willing to do that kind of thing. And I just try to show when I was leading, um, you know, a company or a business that, you know, I would do anything to, you know, make it successful and to support the team. So, you know, I think that's an attitude that people really, you know, they gravitate towards and then they think, okay, you know, this person is really behind me and Mm -hmm. they support me and, and you get a lot more motivated employees that way. I know. Let's let's take a short break. When we come back, here's the question. When all else fails, take your team bowling. Let's take a short break. When we come back, that and much more. Got a copy of the book to give away to closer. 1-800-930-2819. 1-800-930-2819. Uh, when we come back, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about ceiling smashers, how to get involved in that, what that means. For those of you that are thinking, what are they talking about, ceiling? Um, yeah, we'll walk you through what that actually means. Uh, we're going to take a shorty. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Are you stuck in unhealthy habits, toxic relationships, or low self-esteem? Do you crave a life of inspiration, love, self-acceptance, and fun? Sounds like you're on the verge, on the verge to your next big thing. Join Laura Richer, host of On The Verge Radio, helping you use your breakdown for a breakthrough, overcome life's greatest challenges, and live the life you want and deserve. 
Tune in each month on Transformation Talk Radio or visit seattlehealinghypnosis.com for more information. The truth is funny. Shift Happens with Colette Marie Steffen is excited to welcome Karen Benton as a monthly guest host. Tune in on the third Wednesday of each month at 8 a.m. Pacific time to regain confidence and trust in your capacity to create change in your life, your health, your family, and your well-being. Karen Benton is a mother, nurse practitioner, certified body talk practitioner, Franklin Method instructor, and owner of Limitless Living, LLC. For more information about Karen, visit karenbenton.com. Hey, did you know why they call the foundation the foundation? It's called the foundation because it completely eliminates your foundation for what you thought your reality was and creates a whole new space where you can have an entirely new reality that is foundation-less. So from my point of view, they should call it the unfoundation or the foundation-lessness. Either way, there's a big new global rewrite happening again because these guys cannot stop changing. There should be like a change anonymous that Gary and Dane go to. And it's happening April 28th to May 1st. You can find out about it at accessconsciousness.com forward slash global foundation. It's happening in Paris. Go to Paris or do it online or find a pod near you. These are all the options you have. And what else is possible? To see your life from an angel's perspective, book a personal consultation with Claire Candy Hoff, angelic walk-in angel Ariel at Angel Healing House. Candy provides intuitive counseling, Reiki, and angel readings in person in Los Angeles or nationally and internationally via phone or Skype. She will channel the practical tools you need to transform your life. Call now, 831-277-3716 or visit angelhealinghouse.com. Are you, Are you searching? Are you searching? Looking for a sign? A message you need to hear from the great unknown, from the most mysterious place that is the most familiar to your soul in the depths of who you are. The universe puts someone here to talk to, someone God gave a blessing to that you may find insight with. The Angel Lady dot net. 1-800-323-1790. Everybody, welcome back. I re- I want to just you know reiterate something that Chaz said. I have had so many men in my corporate experience that were angels to me. Everyone from Brian McGorry violating AT and T policy so I could leave as a clerk fifteen minutes earlier to go to school, to Bob Davis who put me in charge of restructuring the entire phone company overnight out of a phone book. And Carlton Brown, who literally stood up for me. So, you know, this is not a conversation about all men are bad. This is a conversation about strong woman and what it means. Chaz, the story itself is enough to really get you moving. Let's take a few minutes and just back up a little bit and give, give folks a little taste about what this story is about. Sure. So the closer is about the first female CEO of a sports company and a secret society of professional women who help her succeed called the Ceiling Smashers. And um, it's uh, basically, you know, it's, it's really the tone is about um, positivity and collaboration and women, women helping other women. So can you talk a little bit about whether or not women do help other women. There is this notion that women don't help other women. And I I think you and I should talk about that for a minute. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because uh, Mm -hmm. I think people assume that if you're a woman, um, you know, in an organization, you know, you're going to help other women. And and I've been surprised because, you know, in a lot of the companies, there weren't very many female um, senior leaders. And a couple of times when I asked people if they would help me, the women would say that women said, no, I just, you know, I don't have the time. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I was a little surprised by that. Um, 
And I said, I'm not going to do that when I'm in this position. And I've always, you know, really tried to make time to mentor people and help people. And I advise a lot of um, startup female CEOs today. But um, I think, you know, I've definitely had more male mentors just because there were more male senior executives. But uh, the, the, the thing that I did find that um, helped me a lot was that, you know, from my uh, undergraduate at Cornell and also um, my MBA at Wharton, there are a lot of women that I can call on. Basically, you know, they're kind of my ceiling smasher group or, or my ceiling smasher society, and I can ask them for advice or I can talk about the situation and see what their take is on it. Um, or I can just, you know, say this is uh, some crazy thing that happened to me and, and get their empathy. And I think, you know, you do need to have that support system if you want to succeed in business. And, you know, also it can be just extremely helpful. If somebody can say, hey, you know, I'll make a call and see if this person can talk to you about, you know, this, you know, manufacturing technique or something. And, you know, I think women helping other women is, is just something that's going to be positive for everybody. Mm -hmm. When I interviewed Gloria Steinem, she said something that I never forgot. She said, we all stand on the shoulders of those that have come before. And that's been so important for me to remember. You know, there's also a quote on your website that I was looking at this morning. And I want to talk with you about it in, in in the minutes we have left here. It says, when something bad happens, you have three choices. You can let it define you, let it destroy you or you can let it strengthen you. And I am so glad that we could have an awareness where we can choose that. You know, Viktor Frankl is one of my heroes. Um, Wasn't around when he was around, but somebody handed me a copy of his book. And I read about how he was able to literally take these three choices that, you know, you have this quote on your website Mm -hmm. and live his life. These are universal choices, aren't they, for us now in the world? This is Mm -hmm. what we we really have to look at for ourselves as women, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, you have to have a strong sense of what what is your purpose in life and what you want to do in life. I think, you know, you've obviously embodied that extremely clearly. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of people need to figure that out. And, and once they figure that out, then, you know, these challenges that come along, you know, they just need to not let them deter them in any way from achieving their goal. Yeah. Um, as you talk to different people, you do radio shows, you're signing books. What are women saying to you? You know, it's been really interesting because actually on Amazon I have 100% five-star reviews so far. So that's I saw great. that. But, you know, yeah, it's exciting. But, you know, women are, are coming up to me and saying, I have never read a book like this. You know, where has this book been? And, you know, they, you know they're saying, I, I think about the character of Vivian Lee. You know, long after I finish the book, I, you know, I keep thinking about her. And, and I'm thinking, you know, what would she do in this situation and how would she handle this problem? And it's interesting because a lot of people have said, I started to read it, and I could not put it down, and I literally finished it in two days. And, you know, it's yeah, kind of yeah. a long book, but uh, the yeah. chapters are short, so I think it's, you know, a pretty fast read. But I, you know, I, I think most of the people that um, have spoken to me have said, you know, it was just such a, you know, it was such an engrossing story that, you know, I really it felt it resonated with me, and um, I just, you know, wanted to keep reading. So so it's actually the first book in, a, in a, the Ceiling Smasher series. So I've got, you know, uh, two more books planned. So I just started working on the second book. And people are saying, when's the second book coming out? So Mm -hmm. (laughs) I need to move a little faster on that. Well, I have to tell you, I had the same experience in reading it. I mean, it's not the kind of book that you want to put down. Because I think what it does is it takes you on a journey that a lot of us can personally relate to. You, Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I think a lot of us can personally relate to it. Whether you're looking at situations Um, where you had to think outside the box. And I really did take my team out bowling. Uh, Clearly, that was against company policy. But sometimes you just got to do things that don't make sense to executives. You know what I mean? I think, yeah, I totally agree, Dr. Pat. I mean, if you don't break some rules, then, you know, you're not going to have as much fun. But (laughs) but I think, yeah, you just have have to do what you think is, you know, the the best thing. And, and, uh, you know, you can always apologize later if it's something small. But it's, you know, 
<laughs> I work with a great team of people now. The reason I get to show up is because I work with a great team of people. You know, they have won an international team award for best team. And wow. they would That's never awesome. tell you that. They would never tell you. You would never know it. They don't talk about it. Um, but, you know, the motto of I'm going to take some risks and, um, you know, I'll ask forgiveness later. They've heard me talk about it and that's what they do. And I'm glad they do because, you know, we, none of us would be here without the people around us. And I really Mm -hmm. do believe that. Uh, Thank you for today. One last question. What is your personal message Shaz? what would you like to leave us with today? I think the message is really just about hope and positivity and never giving up. I think you can achieve your goals if you just, you know, if you just continue to be resilient and relentless and resourceful. And, um, you know, I think anything's possible. Yeah, I love it. Please give out your website one more time. And again, how can people get a copy of the book? Uh, uh, My website is feelingsmasters.com. And the book is available on um, Amazon and barnesandnoble.com and also greenapplebooks.com. It's called The Closer. And thank you so much for all that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for taking this very powerful message out into the world. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Pat. I really enjoyed it. And, you know, you have such a powerful message that you're sending out. So, so keep on doing it. Absolutely. And for those of you out there, it is the closer. Um, please make sure you get a copy of it. And uh, I can't wait till we get book two and book three. Let's take a short break, everyone. More coming up on Transformation Talk Radio. Yes. The preceding audio was via a Skype call.